Hello everyone, welcome to another episode of Show Up with Cameron Grand. I'm Cameron Grand, just your friend going along his own mental health journey, trying to figure out the tips and tricks that he uses on his own mental health journey that will hopefully you guys will hear and use them on your own, if you like. If you don't want to, then don't, it's okay. No big deal. Everybody's journey is your own. And again, as I say every week, I'm not a therapist. Take these th things, leave them. It's all up to you. This week, I thought it'd be fun to celebrate Pride Month uh, with a good old double watch of the old show, Will and Grace, which had a recent uh, comeback. I wanted to do that because I was just like, oh, how can I celebrate Pride Month as a member of the LGBTQ community myself? I wanted to just talk about that briefly. I'm going to do an overview of mindfulness this, this, um, this episode because Next week, we will be moving on to interpersonal connectiveness, which is basically how do you make friends? How do you set healthy boundaries? How do you live a healthy life with other people in the world? Because some people think the best way to do this for your mental health journey is to cut everybody out and make sure that you are the only one that matters. If your therapist tells you that that's a route that you can do, then that's good. But you should have your th those people tell you whether or not that's a good route. Me personally, I think that that's a bad way to go because at the end of the day, we're all human and humans need community to thrive. We all live in a world where we wouldn't have things like food if there weren't people supplying those things. And it's kind of like supply and demand only happens because people need people to meet those demands. I don't like when people just cut off anybody who upsets them because that's the easy solution rather than sitting down and having a conversation because connecting and getting through the hard times are how you know you have really close friends. I just really wanted to say that before we move into that next week because I struggle with that still. So I will be giving the things that have helped me with my struggle journey. I'm not the strongest at it. Mindfulness. I think I got really well. Sometimes my brain doesn't let me stay in the moment, but I'm usually able to catch those thoughts sooner when they're starting to spin off and go other places and be like, no, 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 no. Come back, little bro. We're um, supposed to be in the now. You're thinking about the past for too long and you're getting depressed. We don't need to think about the past because the past cannot be changed. It cannot be rewritten. All you can do is live your life and try to live it the best way you know how. With that, let's begin. Will and Grace. I'm going with the pilot and a new lease on life. And basically a synopsis for the for the that those episodes are in the pilot. We have when Grace gets a marriage proposal, Will risks their friendship by telling her what he thinks. Not a good synopsis, I'm just letting you know. Um, basically what happens is Will has an opinion about Grace's boyfriend and they've been going out for a very long time and he thinks that they should have she should have ended the relationship a long time ago and he doesn't know how to tell her that without becoming off as a bad friend. I get where that would be a struggle because you want to make sure that you're there for your friends and you don't want to say anything that makes them feel like you're not supportive and when really you're trying to be supportive by saying you deserve better and it's kind of like a tricky line to cross and then episode two come and do two because they're shorter uh, sitcom episodes. Will must decide whether to support Grace's independence by encouraging her to take an apartment across town or selfishly keep her close by inviting her to share his living quarters. It's called Will and Grace and as everyone who's ever watched a sitcom knows, usually they try to keep the main characters as close together as they can because usually we as humans just love watching shenanigans happen. That's what basically every premise of every sitcom is. Uh, literally Modern Family is all about the family and it literally goes between all their different households and different like shenanigans they're all going through. Same thing with Friends. I'm trying to think of other ones. I, I watch television, I swear. 30 Rock, but 30 Rock is more about you know, being in Rockefeller Center and creating a, you know, SNL type comedy. But yeah, those are the two episodes. I encourage you to watch them. I am actually not a huge Will and Gray fan. And I say that not because I have a problem with it. It's just, I feel like it came way later in my life and I enjoy it. It's just a lot of like the jokes are signs of the era. So for that, I say forgive it. But also I think a lot of it is still relevant now because a lot of the way that people are expressing themselves and while the way we're treating each other is still relevant with, in order for change to happen happen, we have to remember the past and move and make different choices for the future. I do think it's a great comedy. I do love all the characters, Jack, Karen, Will, Grace, mm, magic in a bottle. I love it. But again, I'm a new fan and I'm not like a diehard fan, but I do enjoy it a lot. So with that, let's begin the first episode. I'm going to stop it at one minute and 23 minutes in. We just got over the opening joke of the sitcom because usually every sitcom starts with the beginning joke, the main story, and then the end joke because that's how it's usually broken down for a sitcom. I just find it funny that just start the show, they make it out seeming like Will and Grace are going to be a couple and that literally <laughs> it goes across and then we threw a very 
good misdirection. Find out, oh, not only is Grace with somebody else, but uh, Will is also gay. And I thought that was a really funny turnaround. And the reason why I liked it is it's very much a way of showing how we don't actually know what's going on with in other people's lives. We only know what we know when they tell us. So it's kind of like, oh, okay. Um, and, and the reason why I say this is because I, I like it because it's kind of teaching you how to, when things go against your assumptions about people, to kind of embrace it and let it go. Don't get upset by it. It's just like, oh, this is what the show's about. It's kind of the relationship, but it's very a platonic friend love. And you just got to see that as it goes across. And I, I like that they do that in like a minute to really show you what, what the relationship is going to be like. We are at 403 and Grace just said, why can't you just let me feel my feelings? This is a, a great line to stop on and just to analyze because basically Grace came in really hot and heavy because her boyfriend, instead of listening and being on her side, says, well, maybe if you you didn't delay, you wouldn't have had your fabric that you need to make a presentation for work be late because you are always behind. And the reason why I wanted to highlight and point this out is because I feel like a lot of us feel like we aren't given the opportunity to feel what we want to feel. And something that I've noticed, especially with DBT, is when you finally allow yourself to live in the moment and allow your feelings to matter in those moments and then let them go with the next, I feel like it leaves you with not having to have what Grace is requesting as much. Like you don't need to like have people hear what you feel because basically you're not expressing or fully feeling your emotions until you're telling somebody else. You're kind of wrapping it all up and bottling it up instead. So you're not really going through all those things in the moment. You're just waiting to and like reeling and fuming, which can sometimes feel like 30 minutes, an hour, a full day because you're waiting to finally just talk to somebody, get it all out instead of like letting it fully have its moment when you're triggered and have those emotions starting. That's kind of what I wanted to point out because with mindfulness and one of the things that you, you'll realize as you practice that is if you accept that the good times have to come with the bad times, usually that means when the bad times happen, you know that the good times are going to come back. So it's kind of like they don't have as much power. They don't need to linger as much. So you're able to let things go more. But it is still disappointing to like not land something that you really want because something outside of your control didn't happen on time, which, which is important to feel those things. The mistake here is was that Grace was looking for somebody else to validate her feelings and your feelings matter whether or not somebody else validates them because they are valid because they are your feelings. Since I'm going to break into interpersonal connection if next week, at 4.40, uh, that's when Will says, sounds like the kind of person that you should have dumped a year ago. But he says it under his breath and when Grace is out of the room and then when she says what, he's like, oh no, nothing. Uh, I, mean, I said this and he kind of changed what he said. And with interpersonal connectiveness skills, you'll learn how to have those tough conversations because I've said this before, I'll say it again. Anticipation is my hardest emotion to go through. So what I love about this is he's avoiding telling Grace how he feels. So it, it's built in him. So he gets kind of resentful because he's like, having to hear about this relationship that he feels like Grace shouldn't be in anymore. And the reason why I feel like interpersonal connectedness is important in this moment is because you as a friend have a valid opinion. And if you're really concerned that some like your, your friends in a long relationship, a lot of people might tell you to butt out if they're happy. And I'm not saying that's not a good motto, but I do also feel like if you are concerned and you want your friend to consider what you're witnessing as a third party, first, I would probably sit them down and then tell them, I'm telling you this because I'm concerned for you, but I also want you to be happy. So if you choose to still be with this person, I will be resentful. I just feel like they are holding you back and they're making you feel like less than you are. And I know that you tell me that they make you happy. And I just want to make sure that if you're allowing this person to change and make you feel like you're less than, that that sacrifice you're making is worth it for you because it concerns me and I just want to make sure you're aware it's happening so that way you can address it and hopefully come out of it better with this person if you communicate or you know realize it's happening and then leave them. I would make it more about your care and love about that person not about you judging who they're with because your friend is more willing to listen if you're telling them the things you're seeing about the way they're acting that's concerning you and not about their 
chosen loved one because people love who they want to love and it's not really up to you to choose who's worthy of that and who isn't all you can do is tell them if you're choosing this person that's fine i have no problem with that i just have noticed some things that are concerning for me so if you're going to continue seeing them i just want to make sure that you don't get lost up in there 544 i stopped it because when you are close with somebody and you know that they love you and you love them you kind of have a freedom to be your full authentic self without judgment or any real like repercussion which there are because you but you have to make sure you set boundaries if it's starting to hurt you but what i love about the jack and will's relationship is they're kind of very catty and mean to each other but you can tell at the end of it they really care for each other because the conversation switches at the drop of a hat literally jack gets to will's apartment to move in and he's like oh grace isn't feeling well i'm sorry i should have told you that and jack literally just spent all this time bringing his life to will's apartment and he's like yeah you're not to move in tomorrow and i find that that hilarious because Jack could have gotten really angry so he did let some of the anger out and then after he like vented his feelings he ended it with by, by saying oh okay well when should I be here tomorrow and Will's like eight and he's like okay I'll be there then but I like that because it's literally a case study of what I was talking about it's like Jack and Will Will tells Jack something Jack's upset he fully engages in that moment and fully tells his friend how he feels they go through those emotions and then they go back to honoring and respecting his friend's plan and moving on with his life and I feel like even though what the words they're saying could hurt people's feelings if you're not used to that kind of relationship i do find it well, one the words are funny they're hilarious but it's also kind of pokey funny and you have you can do that with close friends not friends that you're not close with because it can come off as rude if you're not close with that person but like they let those moments happen and then move on and i feel like that's important to do with your friends because we all need to be called out on what we're doing especially when we allow a friend to travel all the way across town to only then make them travel all the way back yeah you have to give your friend the right to be upset when they show up at your house and you tell them that seven minutes grace calls with Will tell Will that she need, she wants to stay in his apartment again, and he and he agrees without a second um, thought issue with this. You literally just told Jack to come tomorrow to stay with you, and you didn't think to call and ask Jack if he was okay before agreeing to Grace staying with you again. I have a problem with this only because I don't like when you make it evident to friends, even if it's the, the reality and the truth of it. Your friend shouldn't know which friend you favor. I mean, it is called the Will and Grace show and Jack does make fun of it and, and call that out later in the series, if not this episode. But the whole point of a friendship is, I don't know, check in if the plans are going to further change before you agree to something. Don't just agree to something. I don't know. I feel like it invalidates Jack a little bit. We are at 11 minutes and 19 seconds. It's when Grace announces that she's going to end it with her boyfriend, Danny. I don't even know how to begin to address breaking up with somebody because I've not really ever been in a relationship. So I won't give advice on that. That's part of why I'm still learning and going through it into personal connectedness because I feel like that will eventually lead me into a relationship hopefully but what I like about it is Grace realizing that within herself but what I don't like about it is she announces it and then goes off somewhere to kind of feel that emotion and she's in front of friends I'm somebody who advocates that you should be able to feel everything that you need to in front of those you're closest with and all the people at like the house at will's apartment are people she's really close with they play the same game they know each other really well it saddens me when you don't feel like you can have a full emotion you have to go and excuse yourself to another room you have the right to feel what you feel in the moment and don't bottle it up because again feel the emotion now so it doesn't boil over later because you're dwelling on it for so long that it builds into something greater we are at 15 14 grace just told will that she said yes to getting married this my friends if you're an actor is called covering up i learned it in acting school it's when you have an emotion so strong underneath what you're you're actually performing that it comes out of you despite what you're saying. What I love about this is it's kind of like two friends excited, run to each other, they hug. And then when you know that friend can't see you, you emote that emotion. And I feel like a lot of us do this with each other, even though we're not knowing it. We're like, oh, we, we don't want to upset our friends, so we're putting on this faith. But sometimes our pain is so much that it still comes out of us in our eyes or sometimes in our tiny movements, or like movements in our muscles. I don't know, if you feel that upset about your friend saying yes, like I said, have a conversation, tell them 
them, you didn't want to say anything because you wanted to be happy for them, but you just wanted to make sure that they're doing it for the right reason. And then say, after this moment, if you choose to go forward with it, I won't say anything, I'll accept it, and I will just be there and be happy for you because that's what I want to do as your friend. But I had to make sure I told you how I felt so I didn't regret it later on if something happened. And that's kind of what I do sometimes. I'm, I'm, I'm like, I want you to be happy, but I need to say this because I would feel terrible if you didn't have this information in your head and then something that I fear happened happened as a result of me not telling you, which is normally what I do if I feel that strong of an emotion. I'm like, because otherwise I'm dreading it. I don't want to talk about it, but I've learned sometimes it's better to just tell your friend the thing that you most worry about them getting upset over. But I do love the fact that he is trying to be there for Grace and be happy for her because she said she's getting married. Okay, well, it is 1644 and Will told Grace, but he did everything that you should not do, which is make it about the person. <laughs> you should not tell the friend that they should not be with that person and you should definitely be not say, just think about it. If you really wanted to be with that person, would you have asked for my permission? That's a whole other like thing we could break down because that's very codependent. Codependency is worrisome because you should be able to be your own person without another person because I feel like you should love somebody as an equal and you should support each other during life's challenges. You should not need that person to function fully because then if that person's gone, on a trip or not there when you're struggling, ooh, life is gonna be so much harder for you. But yeah, uh, if you want an, an exhibit of what not to do if you wanna tell your friend you're worried about their now fiance, watch the scene between Will and Grace before 1645, because you know, you don't tell the person all the things that you think that is wrong about the, that man and your friend. It is a hard conversation, but you don't say it in a way that makes your friend sound idiotic for being with them or like they're doing it for the wrong reasons. You just want to say, I want you to be the, your full authentic self that you are with me. And I don't want you to be less than, in my opinion. Uh, but it's hard, especially when you're going through your emotions to say that in a good way, because sometimes it can get slipped that past you. 1933, we just watched the scene where Grace comes in right after she went right down to City Hall to get married. To me, sounds like a revenge marriage. Not a good idea. You do not have a friend tell them that they don't agree with a marriage and then to prove that friend wrong, you're like, hey, honey, you just proposed to me. Well, let's get married today. No, 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 no. Revenge marriage is, I'm pretty sure, never work. But also telling the person when you were like, I called it off is not also good to say, oh, you just want me to be unhappy and alone like you, which is what Grace said to Will. And then Will's comeback was, I never thought I was alone, but and then he and then he just walks out. <sighs> you know, it's hard to hate them. <laughs> That's what I'll say. But again, codependency is strong with these two <laughs> because it is good because you can see that Will, like after the conversation, Grace went and had all these thoughts and then came to a conclusion. But again, you shouldn't do anything to prove somebody wrong. 2145. We just had the full conversation of why Grace decided to not go through with the wedding. And the reason why I like this is because this that was an example of Grace being in wise mind. She wasn't being too too emotional and she wasn't being too logical. She was right there in the middle and so she realized the reason why she didn't want to marry Danny was because even though she loved him, they didn't fit together and the best thing she could do is to like move on to be with somebody else even though she does have this love for them. And I like this because a lot of times people say you should settle for love. At least a lot of people in my family have said that or have done that. And I feel like you want to meet your equal and you want to make sure that the person that you love, it should be easy and it should flow and come uh, and give and take. And, you know, uh, but what I like about it is that wise mind is also what brings Will into the conversation because he's like, well, I know you didn't actually mean what you said about me being alone. I just was, you know, overly critical, and, but I was concerned about you. And so finally we had that conversation I was talking about in the beginning where he's like, here's how I feel. I recognize I did this wrong thing, but I wanted you to be happy. So when Grace confesses that she knew it was wrong, too. He's like, well, you're in a, your movie still. Danny was a plot point. You're going to find that perfect somebody. You just have to get there and just be calm and live the chapters until you get there. And uh, I went from movies to books. I know that was a jump, but that's a good example of talking and preaching mindfulness. You're like, you will get there, but the more that you obsess about the future, it's going to drive you crazy. And the more you dwell on the path, it's also going to you know, be a little hard for you. So you just have to learn how to stick with the moment and move forward. Okay, that was the end of episode one. And it ends, and I feel like the biggest example of codependency, because the thin line that Will and Grace play is if Grace had the opportunity to be with Will, she would be with Will. 
But because he's gay, they don't have that opportunity. And to prove that, they kissed each other and she goes, nothing? Uh, I'm sorry, nothing. And I just find that dynamic is going to be a struggle for the show because it's hard to find a, a new person that you love if you're still in love with your friend who can never be the type of man that you want him to be. And I just find that interesting and also a good way of just loving and showing up for somebody as they are. Because she could be upset by that, but no, she just accepts him and then moves on with it. But she has those emotions. And I feel like they'll never, probably never go away. But it's kind of like a thought of if you weren't, this would happen. So until then, we're going to be best friends. Alrighty, we're now on episode two, new lease on life. Okay, we are at 155. And unlike the previous, you know, opening joke, this opening joke has a little bit of story in it. And what I like about it is, well, I already told you that they're going to end up living together. It's a good example of avoidance because Grace has broken up with Danny. She needs to move on and find a new apartment. And instead of doing what is a very little amount of work, she's avoiding it because if she does that, then she has to accept her choice and move on for progress to happen in her life. So she's avoiding doing that. And then she's like, what a great idea would be if instead of doing all that work looking for an apartment, if I just moved in with you. And Will's like, well, aren't we adults? We don't need it up like roommates. I don't like that mentality because I feel like roommates, especially if you like the person you're rooming with, can be a great situation because then you have somebody checking in on you every day. But what I love about it is it's kind of like, oh, you're pushing your friend to just follow through on the thing that they're saying. And in interpersonal uh, connectiveness, one of the things that you'll eventually learn is just when you set a boundary or when you make a decision about somebody, you have to follow through on the thing you told them. People will respect your boundaries if you make it clear that you will not tolerate them not respecting them because people, I wish it wasn't the case, but people will take advantage if you give them the opportunity. And that's not okay, especially when it comes to your own mental health. If you tell them you need this thing and they go against it, then they're probably not the friend that you want. But what I love about this is Will, even though, and he's very codependent with Grace, does try to challenge and push her to do like the next step of her decision. But they do a lot of, I just want to know what you think before I say what I think, because I feel like what you think is better for me. That's an interesting situation to find yourself in. I love follow throughs on joke. It's four minutes and Will goes to Jack to talk about what he's going through with Grace and he literally says the line, oh I forgot, it's always about you. And then Jack denies it and then follows who literally just go into a rant um, and respond about things that have to do with only him, but as but disguising it as though it's about somebody else. He's like, oh my God, you're in love with me. That must be why you're talking to me right now, which had nothing to do with Will's problem. And here's the thing that I love relationships, especially with friends. Sometimes I wonder if we, if, <laughs> if it's knowingly that we're just doing things to upset our friends because we know it's so funny to see them react because that's definitely Will and Jack's like personality and types of friendship they have is they're just trying to get under, under each other's skin and when they get upset they know that they're friends but it's just where their friendship lives the most is in those hot heated places. 609 Karen is a riot. It's just a funny juxtaposition to Jack's not listening to then follow up with Karen's not listening to Grace's problem but Karen just takes it a step further by literally Grace is like oh, I need to find an apartment I need somewhere to like to go to live and then Karen's just over there with her sweaters and her dresses being like oh I already have have this fancy expensive dress in but you know what I could be upset or I could just have two and then she just goes to her next shopping thing and I just find it so funny how unobservant she is and the real joke is she is supposed to be Grace's assistant which means she's supposed to be listening and the only reason Grace lets her get away with it is because she has connections that will help Grace make money in her business because let's be honest, she's terrible at her job. I feel like every day that Karen is at Grace's business is a more exciting day. So I don't know, you kind of have a, a, a payoff to what is a give or take, sorry. Nine minutes, Will trying to get Grace to push herself to try getting the apartment more and believing in herself, which I like because believing in yourself is important for everybody to do, but it's kind of like, I feel avoiding the conversation that really needs to be happening, which is asking Grace, really why she doesn't want to find another apartment, why she needs to live with him. Like, why is the, that like where she wants to do? Why is that the easy choice? Why is that? I don't know. There are a lot of questions that are being avoided. They're being avoided for comedy's sake. I understand that. But it's kind of like you need to ask the hard questions in life to make grounded, better, mentally sound choices that will help push you forward and make you happy and satisf satisfied with your life. I do think the only thing that I agree that Grace said is we don't know that. Uh, how would I know that? 
uh, you, you say you know that, but how would I know that? Because I'm just going by what you're saying. I don't like it when it you somebody says, oh, that, that will be a terrible like the decision. We both know that because you're kind of saying that your opinion is the only sound opinion. And I, I don't I disagree with that because there are many things to look at a situation. It's important to hear your, what you feel out, but it's also important to hear somebody else out. So that's the only thing that I disagree with that Will said to Grace because it's important for her to push to be the next step and it should be her own decisions and she should believe in herself. But I also feel like you're doing a lot of pushing to not get to the core of what she's really avoiding and, and by not asking herself why she'd rather live with Will. 1026 and Grace, she found an apartment in Brooklyn Heights and get off at the Borough Hall stop. And I stopped it there because that's literally where I lived my first year in New York City, literally on that stop because that's where our school uh, housed everybody. I don't know if it's gonna show us the outside but like I know the entire street. I know the uh, Brooklyn Promenade. I I know all the businesses that are there. I went to the Regal literally around the corner from my apartment all the time because I'm a movie lover. But uh, I just wanted to stop and engage in a little bit of reflection of the past because it is good to do that because it's reflection is good. It's just not good to dwell on that. So like have a little happy moment, have a little like, oh, remember those times? Those were great. Like those are okay. But like don't wish and long and like pull yourself away from the present for too long. You know, I just wanted to use that as an example of, okay, I went through that and it was really a great time in my life. And I learned so much about myself and so much about the world. And I learned how to push myself more than I ever thought I could. And I also learned, I guess, the truth about where I stand with my family. And while that caused me a lot of mental pain and I'm still dealing with that, I guess I'm grateful that I learned that lesson sooner in life rather than later, because that's when I started looking for actions to like louder than words because every, a lot of people will say me things to me that don't actually match up with what they're doing or how they're treating me in their life. And so as somebody who can't pick up on context clues very quickly, I've started to use those to help guide me in my life. Uh, 1322, the funny way we realize what we wanted is not what we thought we wanted because Will this entire episode has been telling Grace that he doesn't want to live with her. And then when, it, when he's forced to acknowledge the reality of what Grace living in Brooklyn would mean. It's just a brilliant scene with him coming into his house and it's empty. And then he has like an apple and he sits on the couch and he watches television and he's alone with nobody in his apartment except for Jack's uh, parrot, which I find funny. I like this because as we dive into interpersonal connectedness, when we set boundaries, I think that boundaries are important to set, but if you ever set one and then you follow through and then you realize that what you followed through on your boundary, how harsh the like consequences you told somebody or it like avoiding somebody. If you realize it's hurting you to set that boundary, it's not set in stone. You don't have to keep it that way. You can literally, if it's especially if it's with somebody else that you care about and love and want in your life, you can say, I want to change how we go about this because I realize what I wanted from setting this boundary is not what I'm getting. So it's I think it's either too strict or too loose. And from there you can adapt and like inform them because again people should should respect your boundaries, especially those that you love. But they all should know that you're just still learning and you're still trying to find what you need for your, your mental health because mental health is a lifelong journey and it just begins with you making sure that you don't forget about yourself and you're aware and you're in your present self so you know when things are becoming too much for you and you're not able to function and that's when those boundaries are important because you want to make sure that you don't lose sight of you through all of that when you set the boundary that you don't want Grace to live in your apartment and then you realize that you actually want her closer than you thought and that the loneliness you feel by her being so far away can be an issue especially because New Yorkers do not have cars they travel a lot by walking or by train which traveling by train does take a while people who have cars usually don't drive them unless they're going out of the city New York City if you're driving is an exercise and acting like you're a wild animal looking for predators all around you who might attack you at any second or hurt you or who are you you might actually hurt somebody else or it's kind of like it's a very active mindscape um, and not everybody can handle it. I'm a professional driver, so I have no problem. I don't like that. I just said it like that. I do think that's a good revelation to have now before Grace is gone forever <laughs> rather than later when she's already moved in officially and all her stuff's there. So he can either help her find somewhere closer or, you know, move in together, which I already spoiled that they're going to do. 15, 16. This is when Will is telling Jack that he wants Grace to move back in and he realized that he 
needs her in his everyday life, not in a occasional, uh, I'll see you whenever we have time to hang out as friends, which I relate to so much because there are people that I need in my everyday life that I have not seen in a while. And it upsets me because you're like, I love you so much and I see you so little and it makes me feel bad. Again, good revelation. However, again, Will's not very tactful when it comes to Jack, which Jack does tend to just allow his emotions to flow out in his actions without a second thought. So I guess it's hard to just tell somebody like that, but you should probably not just say, uh, again, you value Jack's friendship. You you value Grace's friendship, but you shouldn't kick somebody else out of your house and, and like devalue them. I don't know. That's the only thing I have a problem with this again, is that the devaluing of Jack for Grace's benefit is one thing I don't like in at least two episodes. You know, I've called Will and Grace codependent, but at 1746, it's literally the scene between Karen and Jack and they, I guess, just met and they kind of, one, really vibing, but two, it's funny to me because they're both so involved with either Grace or Will that they have opinions that affect their lives because they don't agree with Will and Grace moving in together. So the codependency I was talking about seems like it runs in fours in this so show because, I don't know, my friend's decisions don't matter that much to me, but they really matter to both Karen and Jack. We're at 2029. One thing I like about uh, the scene that just happened, which is when Will finally goes to Grace and tells her that he wants her to move in with him. I liked the fact that even though that Will convinced her to move somewhere else and not with him before, Grace, even though he's trying to revert his decision, said, well, you convinced me to do this and now I feel like I need to see it through, which I like because we all have things once we set our minds to that we need to at least see through before we make our next move. And I like the mental forethought to allow those things to happen because then you're, I don't know, staying in the present because in order to see how things go, you have to see how you feel one day after the, the other, and then eventually you'll know whether or not this is the right thing for you or whether or not you need to go somewhere else. Literally, <laughs> less than 10 seconds after I've just paused, 2046, she sits down and says, okay, I've done this. She's now ready to move in with Will. Hilarious, because she needed a lot less time to change her mind than I thought, which is okay. 2112, it's the end of the episode. Hilarious that you can just do something with without even having to talk to your friend. And it's one of the best things in acting when an action is all you need to convey something and to walk into somebody's apartment with a but like who's giant suitcases of luggage and just to walk immediately into what will be your room, hilarious. Especially because Will's like eating ice cream. So obviously he's like trying to go through his emotions and disappointment of not having Grace move in. And you kind of see the switch happen when this happens. And he's like, oh, she is moving in. There's like a smirk and then they say goodbye to each other. I know it's a great moment of, okay, Okay, we've, we've come to this decision, so we're both happy with it. We're going to see how it goes. And that is where I'm going to leave this episode. I hope you guys enjoyed me diving into Will and Grace and a couple of the DBT skills that uh, come up to mind. I hope you enjoyed learning that. Grace literally moved to where I lived in Brooklyn. I have heard that Brooklyn used to be really bad and this this season takes place in 1998. I don't know how different it was from 2014 when I lived in Brooklyn in the same place, but like there, there were jokes about Murderville and stuff like that. And I feel like maybe that's just a Manhattan mentality about Brooklyn because I thought it was lovely. I walked around late at night. I mean, obviously anywhere in New York, you have the chance of like people being jerks because that's just how it is. But if you're a New Yorker, if you meet any New Yorker and you get this into a building they're the most lovely people but on the street in transit that's when they're not really so clear about whether or not they're good or not because like anything can happen and every all new yorkers are prepared for the worst until they're in a safe location where they can show you who they really are but it's kind of i guess survivalist over there for at least the first encounter like i've met celebrities who i'm like oh my gosh this day, this guy is a jerk because they look like they're about to like you know kill somebody because of the face they have when they, they move through the street and then you get them into a building and, and then they start talking and i'm like oh they're really nice they just have mastered that death stare telling you not to mess with them and aaron kennedy uh she was a new yorker which i didn't know and i was like wow i just always seem to find the new yorkers and because <laughs> my my best friend is uh anthony is also new yorker but next week we'll be diving into interpersonal connectedness and i can't wait for this it will be a little harder for me because it is something that i struggle with but i'm not doing this 
as an authority. I'm just doing this as somebody going along their own mental health journey, trying to give you the tips and tricks that have helped me along the way to hopefully you can find something and use it for yourself. Again, not a therapist, but I'm saying that because you will definitely know I'm not a therapist next week when I talk about those things. But again, it's all about experimentation with mental health. It's all like, okay, I found this skill. Let me try it. Did I like it? Okay, I did like it, but it didn't seem like it helped. Or maybe I wasn't as strict about what I needed for mindfulness. Like maybe I was mindful and I, it helped me like for a couple of hours, but then I lost it. And then I was upset for like a, like for eight hours after I lost it because I didn't know how to get back to being mindful. Like it's all about, you have to learn like what skills you can use and then you have to practice. And only by practicing them, can you get really good at them. For instance, I used to be really good at mindfulness and then we're taught by society that the people that are supposed to be there for us are families are supposed to show us unconditional love. And because of that, as somebody who I don't care what other people think about me, but I really care about what people I love think about me, because I was tr being treated so badly by my family, I started to believe that that meant something was wrong with me and not that something was wrong with my family, which it's not for me to correct my family. They have their own way of going about life. They have their own things they're going with, but I'm human. They are human. We all make mistakes. We all have flaws and it's all about accepting those flaws and embracing the person as they are and then moving forward setting healthy boundaries so we can all engage and love each other and have relationships that are about an equal exchange and not about one-way connectiveness because if you send energy to somebody else family friend teacher doctor anything it, that energy should be returned to you and if somebody doesn't return your energy they probably are somebody you need to either spend less energy on or you need to cut out of your life. But I caution anybody who decides to cut somebody off out of their life. I've said it before in this episode, make sure you don't dehumanize them because you can cut somebody out of your life and recognize them and treat them as human and love them and not make it so they are no longer worthy of life because people have done that to me and that is where I started to feel like I wasn't worthy of life because I was treated as less than human and that is not okay to treat anybody as less than a human being worthy of being on this earth. Your family, your friends, strangers, nobody has the right to treat somebody is less than human. I don't care who you are or what your opinion is, that's not okay. And so that is my caution if you do decide to cut somebody out of your life. I would say address it as a, as a human and say, I love you, but I've tried making this relationship work with you and it feels like what I need from a friend or what I need from a family member is not something that you are either willing to give me or wanting to give me or maybe it's just not something you're capable of. And so I have to remove myself from this relationship because otherwise I will just continue to hurt myself and I'm tired of hurting. And that's why I said I caution is like it will it will hurt in the moment. But if you tell somebody you're not you don't hate them, you just want to make sure that you're not hurting each other anymore. I feel like that goes a long way. I have people that I will still check in on, but I have l left them out of my circle of friends. But I still care about them and want them to be OK wherever they are living happily happily with whatever they choose to do with their lives. Um, and that's where I'll, I'll leave it is you are worthy of the life that you want. And I just want you to remember that. And so with that, thank you guys so much. See you guys next time. And that's it for this episode. Bye. <laughs>